Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're here today to talk about uh, writing and translating in Korea today. I'm the literature director at British Council based in London, and um, I've been working with the literature team here um, with our partners in Korea and British Council in Korea to curate uh, the cultural program that uh, accompanies the uh, Korea market focus at London Book Fair this year which has been very exciting and, of course, top of, the, um, top of the list of topics of conversation is translation from Korean to English and English to Korean. So I'm very, very uh, excited to be joined by three very distinguished literary translators. Brother Anthony of Taizé was born in Cornwall but has been living in Korea since 1980, teaching English literature in Sogang University in Seoul, where he's now emeritus professor. He's also a chair professor at Dunguk University and is currently serving as president of the Royal Asiatic Society Korean branch. He's published more than 30 volumes of English translations of Korean literature, mostly poetry, and including seven volumes by Ko Un and the novel The Poet by Yi Mon Yol, who is also here as part of the Korean market focus. He's published a study on the Korean way of tea. In 1994, Brother Anthony became a naturalized Korean citizen, taking on the Korean name of An Son Jae. Chris Lee was born in Seoul, studied in the United States and England. Her first book, the collection of short stories called Drifting House, was published in 2012 by Viking Penguin USA and Faber and Faber in the UK. It made the San Francisco Chronicle and Kansas City Star 2012 Best Books of the Year list. She was awarded the 2012 Short Story Prize Spotlight Award and was a finalist for the 2012 BBC International Short Story Prize. Her work has appeared in several magazines and newspapers including Granta, The Guardian, Financial Times, The San Francisco Chronicle and Condé Nast Traveller UK. She's a professor of creative writing at Yonsei University's Underwood International College. Shirley Lee read classics and Persian at Oxford. She co-translated the poetry of 10 leading Chinese poets since the Cultural Revolution for the Asia Literary Review. Most recently, she's translated Dear Leader, the memoir of North Korea's exiled poet laureate Yang Jin Soon, which will be published next month by Random House UK. Today, she's working on the Sino-Korean historiography project, War of Words, at Leiden University, editing newfocusint.com, and writing a book of nonfiction about her family in the Korean context. What I'd like to do is asking all the panelists, or each of the panelists, to start talking a little about how you came to be a writer and translator. So I'll start with Brother Anthony, if you would. I'm the oldest, sir. <laughs> Um, I came to Korea in 1980 knowing no Korean <clears throat> and uh, as soon as you arrive in Korea you realize that you have to know Korean or at least some Korean. Uh, so I, I learned some Korean and began also unexpectedly to work teaching <coughs> ultimately uh, medieval and Renaissance English literature in Sogang in the Jesuit University. And um, one day I said to a Korean colleague that while I was teaching these Korean students English poetry, I felt that I ought really also to reverse the process and start to find out something about Korean poetry. And um, so I, then she introduced me to my first poet, uh, Ku Sang, and encouraged me to start there. And one thing led to another. So that I began really po <coughs> publish, well, translating about 1988, 89, and the first book was published here in England by Forest Books by Brenda Walterker uh, in 1990. And now there are 30 more. Chris, yeah. Well, I was, I'm both a fiction writer and a translator. I mean, I, I really call myself more of a fiction writer and a translator more by accident. But actually, I, I suppose, uh, I, I came into literary translation because I fell in love with Korean literature. I mean, I love all the literatures of the world, but the privilege of being able to read a literature in another language was something I very much wanted to take advantage of. And so the more I read, the more 
engaged I was with poetry and the fiction, and then as opportunities came to translate the poetry as well as the short stories, especially the ones that excited me most, I started to do that. And then um, when my book debuted in uh, the US, in New York, uh, one of Korea's uh, most famous fiction writers today, who's here um, at the book fair, uh, Kim Young Ha came to uh, my event, introduced himself, and we started a friendship which led to uh, my now translating his uh, next two books. So in some ways, one becomes a fiction writer, I think, by accident. I mean, I call it all accidental, but really what it is is a lifelong engagement with words from the time you can read. You know, you fall in love with language, whether it's one language or the translated one. And uh, then it just continues um, in various uh, forms as well as genres. Um, but I do think uh, because I come from a fiction background um, in terms of being a writer, of, uh, I think that I approach translation in some ways. How can I say it? I, I really think that um, the translation can sometimes only be as good as a writer as you are in the language you're translating into. And uh, as I look at, as I edit, I also edit work as an editor of Korean, transla of Korean literature, and I do see that pattern. Um, of where sometimes the best writers are, are just going to make the best translators. Shelley. Um, this idea of accidentally falling into translating Korean literature, it, it runs through me as well. Um, perhaps more by accident of environment as much as anything else. I'm Korean, born in Korea, but never lived there. Well, I was born there, so I must have lived there, but um, grew up in Hong Kong in a Korean-speaking family, in an English-speaking school, in a Chinese-speaking world. And it was kind of a necessity to keep my sanity to um, translate what I knew, but I couldn't share or what others knew. And it, 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 kind, of, it, it kind of became, a oh, I want people to get what what is happening and um, it was, um, yeah, so, 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 so that kind of personal background I think was a large part of um, getting into tr the translation part of it um, and also the, um, recently I've been working a lot with uh, exiled North Korean writers and uh, as, as a large part of that, again, it was almost accidental the way I fell into North Korea. I've, 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 I've never been a North Korea person. It, it was just, wow, there's so much in, in here that you, you cannot get into other people's world, you cannot <coughs> interview them to know what their writing is like. You need to read their writing to know what their writing is like. And um, yeah, it's, it's kind of been that impulse to kind of be, a, be, be the dialogue rather than be part of a dialogue, you know, kind of be, be, be the words that make a conversation possible. Yeah. I'd be quite interested to get a feel for the audience. So some people here will know a lot about Korean literature and some will know very little. Um, there's a thin but steady stream of Korean books translated into English. But I wondered, and I was going to ask Chris actually, whether you, f uh, first, whether you feel that that stream represents a fair cross-section of contemporary Korean writing or whether we're getting uh, a distorted view of what's being written in Korea today. I think there's a fair sampling, at least on the fiction side, of both what is a more traditional narrative, I suppose, and, and some work that's more experimental. But um, one, of the, one of the problems, I suppose, or some of the genres that are being more left out that the Dalkey Archives is starting to rectify is that the real form, for me at least, when I think of Korean, fiction, or Korean literature, is poetry and short fiction. Um, the, the short fiction uniformly, whether I, I live in Korea, actually, I forgot to mention that I've lived most of my life there. And when I meet Korean writers, um, their, uh, their affection for the form, they debut in the form. And there's actually a real audience uh, for the short form, though I hear from publishers that that is starting to change in Korea as well. But because of that way of debuting, um, that form has really had a, long, a little longer history. It's developed more. And we don't get very much short fiction that's being translated um, in uh, collection form because it's fina considered financially unviable. 
uh, in uh, most countries outside of Korea. So there is that kind of bias. Um, and then we don't get a much um, of the older fiction uh, that's being translated, though I think more recently there's been a concerted effort to get some of the classic work online. Um, in collections through LTI Korea that is trying to balance the view of where Korean literature came from and where it is now. But we also lose a lot of work. I just had a conversation with a translator this morning uh, in virtual time about um, the di dialect fiction with dialect, regional dialects. We lose a lot of that. We get less of the humorous, quirky, and more extreme experimental fiction. But there's enough of it there that I think uh, there is that effort being made to change that. But the, di the regional fiction is still largely untouched, maybe because it's such a challenge for translators as well. Um, Brother Anthony, in, in an article I read of yours recently, you, you suggested that one of the barriers to greater publishing success for translations of Korean works is that the choice of what is translated is often made by Koreans whose evaluation of their novels and poetry is a rather specific one, is the, use, the, the frame, phrase you used. Uh, you said that they find it hard that Western readers don't evaluate Korean writing on the same criteria. And I wondered if you could expand a bit on that, what you think the evaluation criteria are in Korea versus here. Yeah, well, I think <coughs> it's, uh, if you use the word established, I mean, the, in Korea it's important to be an established writer. And that means to be a, to have a certain age, to have produced, published a number of works and which have been recognized and uh, so Koreans assume that it's these well-known established writers who will be interesting and who should be translated. Whereas, of course, in fact, from a, say, outside point of view, um, <coughs> the younger Korean writers may be writing the kind of literature uh, fiction and so, uh, which is more in tune with uh, world tastes as they are to the younger generation worldwide people in, uh, who are online on Facebook, who are familiar with pop music and so, uh, and the work of <coughs> the fiction written by established uh, fiction writers uh, may then seem to be uh, rather difficult to approach because it's much more rooted in the experience of Korea's recent past and history and a culture which has changed but all of which is totally unfamiliar to the, to the Western reader. Can I add one uh, comment to that? I also, I, I, I agree with Brother Anthony. I'm not sure so much if I, um, how I feel about the idea of culture, uh, that it not working in that sense, but I think the reason why um, the, the younger people might be more, uh, the younger writers might be more immediate appealing, I, frankly, is that a lot of them are getting an education in creative writing, learning how to write in a way that uh, wasn't happening in the past. There's a lot more creative writing programs or classes and those kinds of things available, and they're reading more global literature. And so in some ways, perhaps there's a, a polish to the work that may not be there in the older work, but that doesn't invalidate the older work, and yet it doesn't maybe conform as much to a, a Western ex expectation of an aesthetic. Uh, I'll, I'll, add, I'll kind of build more, one more step further on that, which I was, I was thinking then, then you said then, then I'm going to go one step further, is um, um, I, you know, about, about this trend, um, it's globalization is probably too simplistic a way to put it, but a lot of writers probably, I think, in the younger generation, write with an eye to publishing for the world audience, not anymore just for the local audience, you know, because there was a time when you measured success by being establishment in your, within your own culture, but now people want to have been translated into several languages or have been published by a Western publisher or noticed by the world. Um, and I, I, you know, I wondered the extent to, to which this um, kind of generational trends are affected by people having their values in a different place. One other point, of course, is that uh, in English so far, uh, there's been far more, almost far more poetry published in translation than fiction uh, for various unclear reasons. But Korean poetry actually is probably as such 
uh, more accessible, uh, more, it's often simpler uh, and more attractive than, as I say, especially the older kinds of fiction, which is often rather heavy and rather serious. Uh, and younger fiction is much more humorous, much more, yeah, modern. Mm -hmm. But poetry uh, has more of that quality that you might call universality. Can I just add one last point to com coming off what Shirley said? And I just, I just feel like I have to add this as a fiction writer. I, f I, I, I know many of the writers that are being translated, the younger ones, not all of them, but some of them, some of the most talented people there. And I've had conversations with them. And I think my argument is anyone who's a serious writer in any country, most of the time they are not thinking about their audience. As Kim Young has said in our conversation, our Q&A, really when you're writing and you're struggling to finish a novel, it's so difficult, it's so complicated. You are writing for yourself and the truth of the novel. But what happens, I think, for example, a writer like Han Yuju, who's being translated from um, uh, Korean to English right now, uh, her book has been done, but uh, is that her influences were people like Paul Oster. She grew up reading these writers that were translated, and uh, same with Kim Young ha So this new generation was not just reading uh, uh, their, na their national writers, but many of them were reading more foreign writers than they were their own writers. And I think that's where a lot of the influence is coming from. I'm, I'm just saying I'm glad you made that addition because you know, to say you're writing for an audience, it's not, you know, it's not a matter of targeting, it's more like, where your discourse takes place, you know, in terms of the culture you're plugged into, in terms of what you read, whether in translation or, in, you know, that shapes where you want to speak to, you know. Um, Andrew Motion, in his introduction, I think, to the um, Cohen book, the first the first person, Sor uh, yes, Sorrowful, Sorrowful. Um, he, he suggests that, a, that a f another factor holding back appreciation of Korean literature in the West is, um, a Western prejudgment that only Asian literature that accords with Chinese and Japanese aesthetics, um, particularly with an emphasis on beauty, is good. And I wondered, because there are other Asian literature um, uh, strands which, which are more translated into English, and I wondered whether um, Western publishers are guilty of looking for stereotypical Asian books, a Asian in quotation marks, that they're not finding particularly in Korean writing? Or, or is there some other, other reason for that, do you think? Hum. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Who knows the mind of a publisher? No. Uh, it's always about money, or not always, no. But, yeah. um, the, it, but it's true that it is, this is part of Korea's drama and problem that people don't have an image of Korea. They think they know Japan and they have bamboo leaves everywhere and China uh, uh, willow pattern plates and so or red red guards or whatever but they have an image and people don't have normally an image of Korea. Uh, they just haven't any anything to hook anything onto. Whether, you know, and certainly Korea is not uh, Exotic, uh, you know the um, the whole thing about you know, Orientalism uh, doesn't really apply to Korea. Uh, it's not an exotic other. You can't invest. You know you you don't find that uh, use. Yeah. You don't find Korea being used as a setting much in Western novels. Uh, Japan's Chogun, and China. Now we have detective stories set in Shanghai. Actually, North Korea is better served because we have the D Inspector O series, uh, whereas South Korea still, the only thing we've got is Margaret Rabble's Red Queen, which is not very helpful, really. S certainly in my limited experience reading Korean literature over the last few months for the Market Focus is that it's very, it's very hard to put the requisite lotus flower on the cover of a Korean, Korean book, um, uh, which in a sense, it makes it hard. But that sort of leads on to, and I know it's invidious to ask for a huge generalization, but whether you felt it is possible to identify a characteristic style and tone of Korean writing. Um, I mean, perhaps, perhaps start with Chris and then maybe Shirley. My question would be, can we ever find any characteristic to any national literature? I mean, China, Japan, 
um, were brought up as examples, but I think when we look at even the range of literature that's been translated from Japanese into English, I'm the, the only language you know, I, I'm most comfortable reading in outside of Korean and a little bit of French, is that um, it, it, you do have the, the tradition, you know, the, the, the Go novel and those kinds of things, but you also have uh, Murakami, you have grotesque, the thriller novels, you have this whole body of literature, and that literature, I think, starts to create an understanding of the country's uh, aesthetic, aesthetics, I suppose, as well as the personalities. So it, it, maybe it's a good thing, as you're saying, that when you're reading Korean literature, you can't identify these specific symbols or images because that really means, oh, these Korean voices, that they're particular enough that they're finally writers in the sense that you're, you're reading them as writers rather than as this image. That you have um, to. I, um, I, maybe because um, I'm, I'm, I'm coming at it as a translator rather than, so rather than what are the characteristics of a Korean literature, um, I'm thinking what what is characteristic about translating Korean literature as opposed to Persian literature, which, which, which I also did a, a bit of, um, is um, maybe a lot of it has to do with my background and the way and the language I'm translating into more than about Korean itself. But there's, and maybe, maybe the linguistic structures of Korean, Korean um, affect a lot of how the outside world views Korean literature too um, when it's translated. For example, like in, in terms of poetry, I, I've, I've, I've often had people comment, oh, this is kind of too simplistic, or I don't, I don't know if you know, you've, you've had those comments, obviously, and um, you know, there, there's it just it's kind of a different language of, um, of conveying patterns. And um, you know, I mean, there's standard universal things that happen in translation from any literature, which is, you know, you can't so easily translate li linguistic play or wordplay, but just beyond that, there, th there seems to be something about the Korean language and the way it's used that I think maybe add to how it's characterized by, by people who comment on things like, oh, it's really simplistic. Or, I think you ought to say something about the difference between South Korean literature and North Korean mm. writing. Is there something you could say about ah. difference? Ah, okay. Um, I was just in, in conversation earlier and um, with Brother Anthony, and uh, I've, I've been translating North Korean poetry. And he, the, the, the man whose um, memoirs I just finished translating, he used to be the poet laureate to the dead dictator Kim Jong Il. And his his teachers and parents' generation, they came over from South Korea, or they were kidnapped, or they got separated in the Korean War. So, so, so they were just Koreans who grew up on Korean literature, however you'd like to define that. And obviously, that had to be suppressed because they then suddenly had to start writing propaganda propaganda and um, poetry to serve a political purpose and and and, and interestingly um, the man Jang his name um, he said that he read he had access to this secretly because you know family connections and stuff but a lot of most of his peers grew up on in, in a kind of total vacuum of, of literature all that they had were kind of renditions of renditions of renditions and in some distant past there was something called a Korean literature but now it's all Kim Jong-il literature or Kim Il-sung literature or um, th there's a really funny thing I saw on Twitter. I, um, I, I studied classics, and, and, and in Homer, there's a phrase you see again and again in the Iliad is rosy fingered dawn. Um, and and th there's a bit like in, 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 in Greek where it's rosy fingered dawn is poetic, but red fingered dawn is considered unpoetic by Aristotle. And, I, and, I, and, I, and I, you know, in, in my kind of lame witticism, I'm like, you know what, this is why, because one, one of the other things I've been wondering is how can you get literature in a vacuum, in, in an enforced vacuum, because that's what North Korea is at the moment. Um, the, the reason why North Korea cannot produce, and, 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 and what Greeks and Romans are so known for is to produce literature that serves such an explicitly political purpose to serve the emperor, to serve, serve the empire, but in a very literary rich way uh, as writers, I thought, can you have that kind of political, politically purposed writing in, in, in North Korea? Um, and and in, the long answer is, you know, you could say no because of the vacuum or whatever, but the short answer is no, because in North Korea, you can't have a rosy fingered dawn. It must be a red fingered dawn. That's the only thing you're allowed to write about. I mean, just picking up actually on what you were talking about in North Korea, um, and we, we were talking earlier as well, uh, in um, psychology there's a whole um, strand of research into twin studies, separation studies, where you get 
uh, identical twins separated at birth. It's a, it's a way of trying to separate out nature and nurture. And um, if the partition and subsequent isolation of North Korea weren't, weren't so tragic, it would be an extraordinary experiment in the sense that you have a language that was one language, which um, at a certain point in time has become separated with very little um, interchange. And I wondered um, how far, whether you've got to feel how far the, the Korean spoken by the exiles and the Korean of the Republic of Korea has diverged. You know, is the isolation that North Korea's experienced reflected in the language spoken in North Korea today as far as you can determine? Um, that's a really interesting question because that question, when it's asked a lot, for example, within South Korea, people pick up on accent changes or word changes or things like that. For me, the most startling thing I, I learned during, during this work working with the North Korean poet was, for example, dear leader in Korean is Kyonghae Hanen. She's a dear leader, like dear great leader, respected leader, brilliant, you know, all these adjectives that I think he's got like 35 adjectives on him. But, um, and, 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 and this man, who, who later became the poet laureate of North Korea, grew up thinking that these were pure Korean words, that they were pronouns, that these were adjectives that did not exist outside the Korean language, that these words belonged to Kim. And so he was reading a bootleg translation of Byron, and he was like, adjectives can be used with other people who are not, like, it's not just the language that's enforced into a vacuum, it's the whole lexicon. He, he, he did not know the word respected or dear or whatever could be, could existed outside of Korea where there was no Kim. I know. No, extraordinary. Can I add a bit to that? Um, I, just because I've known defectors for well over a decade, I have worked as an activist for a long time. But one of the interesting things when you're talking about language changes on, on top of that very structural mm -hmm. difference that you uh, mentioned, Shirley, is that, um, that the, the North Koreans who come down to the South um, they don't actually, uh, they feel, when they come, they feel like they're, they've stepped into a foreign language. They think, this is Korean, why don't I understand any of it? And one of the main reasons is because the Korean used in South Korea has changed so much with the influence of the foreign words that we've um, accepted into our language. So we use, a, there's a lot of English that is being used. There's a lot of German related words. And a lot of Koreans might think that these words are Korean, but they're actually mixed, uh, they're, they're borrowed words now and it's from anything from the signs from textbooks to commercials everyday language and so these North Koreans when they come their first year is absolute culture shock and language shock they walk around not knowing what anybody is saying as if it really was a foreign language Just add that it's, it's me like I grew up speaking English as, as a first language in Hong Kong which is supposed to be an ex, you know, British colony, British English. And I went to Britain for university. It was like, I don't understand this British English. And, you know, it's just, the culture has so much, you know, to do with it. Uh, the poet Cohen is the honorary president of, an, of a commission, joint South Korea, North Korean commission, charged with creating a total dictionary of the national language, which mm -hmm. would bridge uh, the differences which would list the differences between the Korean spoken in North Korea and South Korea and among the Koreans in diaspora in Hawaii or wherever. Uh, this is an ongoing project. So uh, the, an, the analogy with an English is where you get an English dictionary which has British English, American English, yeah, Australian yeah, English, New yeah, Zealand English yeah. and, all, and all the other yeah. Singaporean English. And the England. idea is that the day that North and South Korea become one again, uh, <coughs> this will serve as a resource of reference uh, so that people can sort of check uh, what the other one is talking about and re-establish uh, a single unified language again after this division. I mean, it happened in East Germany to yeah. some extent, less, yeah. but yeah. still. Just another little bit of just just sticking with the history in a sense around Korean language because um, it, it struck me that that more than most the Korean language has had to suffer various assaults at various stages in its its history and even in uh, you know, 20th century um, long period where Korean under Japanese occupation Korean was not the language of the state um, it, it was a language that wasn't being wasn't able to u be used in in anything official presumably not in education either. Um, and then a period of censorship, which also has impact on language as well, in the sense that there are things that you're not allowed to say, words that you're not allowed to use. 
And I wondered whether you, you see the effects of those assaults still in Korean language today and, and in the process of translating, um, whether, the, whether that's affected the process of translating, influenced the process of translating at all. I mean, I, I think Chris is suggesting that actually the Korean of the Republic of Korea, South Korea, has caught up pretty rapidly. But, um, but I just wonder whether you see those historic influences of the last 100 years or so in today's writing. We were talking about that a little bit at the British Library with Imanuel last night. Um, <coughs> Yes, until 1945, especially in the years of the Pacific War, uh, you could not publish in Korean. Uh, you virtually could not write in Korean. <coughs> and right through from 1910, from the annexation 1910, nobody was being taught to write Korean or to read Korean at school because the school was in Japanese and the literature studied and the history studied in school were Japanese history, Japanese literature. So <clears throat> the Korean writers in 1945 had to begin to reinvent their language. But, and then they were doing it together until the war broke out. So you had an explosion of very interesting experimental poetry and fiction in, in the years between 45 and 50. But then that diverged because so many of the fine writers and interesting writers uh, either went north or they were kidnapped north or they were killed in the war. Uh, so after the war in South Korea, uh, you, you had to start all over again with what you had left, both as writers and as language. So Korean literature, in our sense, modern fiction or poetry, really doesn't have much history before 1953. Um, I have two short comments on on um, what really started me with Korean poetry personally was with the writers from before the war more than like to me that was to me the personal kind of canon of my, my, my private canon of Korean literature and um, and and in South Korea like growing up in a South Korean world more than you know rather than North Korean to me they were just you know I didn't call them South Korean poets but they were just like of, you know, when you look at it, it's like South Korean poetry. You don't think of them as North Korean poets or North Korean poetry. That's a, such a political term. But, but you know, it's so strange when, when I met these North Koreans and they had the same people in their past. They just weren't allowed to remember them. Um. Could I ask uh, about something that when you read about Korean literature, which, which this may be a, an out-of-date question, really, but um, some people write about the... Um, the concept of Han, have I pronounced it correctly, about um, which is, um, well, because actually what most people say, it's untranslatable. So clearly I'm failing originally by trying to say, but it's essentially, it's, it's, it's the way, the implication is it's the way uh, culturally Koreans respond to adverse things happen, I think, in, in, a, in a way um, that it's internalized with a sort of frustration, a, a railing against things going wrong. And that a suggestion that this suffuses quite a lot of Korean literature. Uh, now, whether that's Korean literature today or whether that's very much Korean literature of the past, but I wonder if you could, perhaps one of you could attempt to explain it better than I have and, and say whether that is still, uh, I'll just say my personal experience of reading the literature that, that has, has been translated is that it's, it's quite bleak, actually, quite a lot of Korean literature. And, and that may be because of what Chris was saying, is that what's not being picked up is the humorous, sort of more quirky, more experimental literature, particularly. But I also wondered whether that was, so I'm trying to get at the notion of, is there a Korean psyche that's su suffusing contemporary literature or not? I'm not sure if this will really answer the question, but I, I do think of the, the Tolstoy um, quote that I'm, I'll just paraphrase about, you know, that all hap happy families are the same, but unhappy mm. families are all different. And I think the tendency of literature in general, actually, if we really look at the body of work, is that it tends towards the tragic or the dark. And I think Korean literature is the same way, but it's not particular to Korea, actually, but to many literatures around the world. 
and though I may be crucified for saying this, I would argue the same for the concept of Han, that uh, that kind of, that, that the word and the particular context may be different, very culturally specific, but I think that the, the deep struggle and the sorrow and that internalized burden of both history and family um, and nationhood is something that maybe more people out there or more nations out there and at a time of particular suffering and gravity would understand, but in a very, you know, they, they might not have that word mm. for it. Um, <coughs> there's an Irish translator of Korean poetry who always says, oh, the Koreans, they have their hand, but the Irish have better hand. Uh. <laughs> um, uh, it's... Um, I mean, it does link up to the experience of life by people who are subject to powers they cannot control or overcome. So that it's, it's the women who embody the Han, you know, the women whose husbands go out to sea and drown and leave them with children and there's no income and there's no food and yet you have to go on. Uh, and that's why it's, it's wrong, I think, e even from a Korean point of view, to separate Han from Hung, uh, which is the sort of, we are still here, we are still alive, we will dance, mm, right. uh, or sing, <laughs> or drink. Um, the, the fundamental action of Korean shamanism is embodied in drinking and dancing. And the point is to exorcise the spirits of Han uh, and of darkness uh, and to bring in some degree of blessing. Uh, so Han and Hung have to go together. And the, the song, I mean, otherwise you end up with sentimentality. I mean, uh, please look after mom, mother uh, is potentially a sentimental story, but it can also be seen, of course, as a story about uh, the mother's Han. But uh, Chinese stories about that kind of mother and lots of other stories and not only Korea, it's not unique to Korea but Koreans rather like to cultivate it. Actually you mentioned please look after mother um, and that leads me on to the next area I want to talk about which is um, you know, uh, words on the page are, are symbols in many respects of so the differences um, not just in the writing, but actually in the, the underlying culture. Um, so by translating, you're making accessible to the reader the much deeper cultural differences, not, not just basically giving you know, synonyms. And uh, you know, I've, I've read, and it may even have been you talking about it, that the original translation of Please Look After Mother was then very heavily edited <coughs> to make it more... Um, uh, attractive, I suppose, to Western audiences. And I was going to ask all three of you, really, and how much Korean-ness you choose to leave when you're translating from Korean into English, and, and how much you feel you have to adapt. And, and are there any particular problems in making uh, Korean culture understandable, accessible to a Western audience or an English-speaking audience? Yes. Well, I think in the case of um, the Shin Kyung suk novel, uh, the editing was not necessarily about getting rid of what, um, I, I think that that's been paraphrased in that way though, in the public, the sense of making it more um, readable somehow or under, understandable to a Western audience, but actually about, a, from what I understand, a third of the novel was, um, was, uh, was cut. And that, all, that really has something to do with both, um, not just culture, but really about pacing, about uh, multi storylines and uh, about Korean publishing culture, which really tries not to. Um, the, the, the word is sarcosanct, and there's very little, there is editing, but very little editing done in a Korean publishing house compared to what happens in a Western publishing house, which also has much to do with culture. Uh, the writing and um, the, the writing, writer's relationship to the editor is very different than what happens here. Um, so that the, the evolution of that book was um, a little different, uh, and I, I can't even remember what the original question. Was. Um, it, it was it was about um, the question was about how much when you are translating, 
how much Koreanness you you Koreanness you feel you leave, and how much you feel you have to adapt, and if there's anything uh, particular that you feel that you have to adapt. I mean, Korean culture, of course, is not British culture, or British culture is not American culture. Mm. But um, especially like, um, <coughs> espe this is more in in fiction. The most difficult thing, one reason why I don't do fiction, is dialogue. The way people talk to each other is not the same. I mean, radically not the same. And uh, one example, of course, is uh, that in Korean, like in Japanese, uh, you have different levels uh, uh, for the verbal endings, uh, which indicate the relative position of the people in a hierarchical relationship, that you're talking down, you're talking up. And if you talk down when you should be talking up, then you get slapped. Um, but uh, you can't translate mm. that. So just picking up on that, would it be easier for, because, it's, because one of the things that interested all of us at British Council in the preliminary research we were doing was how, how many books actually have been translated into French before they've been translated into English. And that there seems to be a, you know, quite a lot of Korean writers live in France where they don't Live some, you know, don't get so many living in this country, and and I just wondered whether you can get a, at least a bit of that nuance of vu versus tu, or well, you know, do I you don't think it's not? It's I much more subtle it's than that. No, is it? it's more subtle okay. than that. Right. I would forget thought. that one. But yeah. I do think, well, I mean, the French is going to be closer in that way with the levels yeah. of speech, certainly. Um, but and uh, what from at least Korean writers' perspectives, they've said that they feel more appreciated in France as well. That they're more uh, open to world literature. So there's that too. But in terms of what happens in fiction, I mean, what Brother Anthony, the very important point he brought up, it's very difficult to translate this the sense of honorifics and the sense of this these differences. He's very essential, important differences in Korea. And what I've tried to do as a translator um, is at least work with the register of the words to communicate that, the formality of speech versus the informality. So it might not be an exact translation. I do try to stay faithful to the, the sentence as much as possible, but definitely in terms of register, I will change things in order to show with, you know, if somebody says something to someone, and it's not ostensibly insulting, but because of the the level of speech, it's an absolute insult. You really need to show that in register. But, and titles are a real challenge too, because in Korean we often don't use names. It's yeah. just Koreans that don't title. use names, they only use titles. If I'm talking to my sister, I call her little sister or big sister. And if you translate a text and keep saying, little sister, are you going home? Big sister, no, I am not going. <laughs> uh, it's awful. Uh, um, and you, yeah. ha you can't do it. I just want to use the, the, the name thing as an example of, of something, I, th I think it's kind of a constant, um, not compromise, but kind of a constant job, task of, of uh, as, as, as far as I'm concerned at least, as, as, as a translator for, of Korean into English, is, is how far do I signal to, to the potential reader of that language that this is a translation that should read naturally to you versus, oh, this will sound awkward to you, but I want to get across that, that you're reading a, a book from another language, you know, there's always that sort of tension. Uh, one of the problems that we have in England with translations of stories published in North America is that usually the people are represented as being gangsters from Chicago or policemen from Chicago because the translators are Americans, they don't even realize how American their slang is. Mm -hmm. But you, it's slang in Korean, you have to translate slang as slang, but American slang is not British slang. Uh, so you'd have to have a totally different translation uh, if you really want, because for us, we keep saying, why are these Korean soldiers talking like Yankees? Uh, it's, very, it, it's very frustrating. It, it's not obvious at all. Um, Shari, you were talking about um, uh, translating poetry and challenges of translating poetry. And I wondered whether um, you mentioned that when Korean poetry is translated, it can seem ostensibly quite simple to an audience. And I wondered whether you could just talk a little bit about the process of translating poetry. And I know, of course, Brother Anthony has also translated a lot of poetry. Are there any aspects that made it particularly difficult to translate Korean poetry into English? Um, may maybe it's more about a phase in English poetry than 
anything to do with Korean poetry almost. Um, for, for example, when, when you translate, uh, I don't know, Latin poetry into English, there's a lot of cognates you can play on. Um, in Korean, obviously, you don't have, you don't have that crut crutch to fall back on. Um, and also, I, I, like, this is a really big generalization, obviously, but I think that the way Korean poets, Korean modern poetry ex ex writes poetry, that the techniques they use are not necessarily the techniques that English language poetry relies on. And, and so do you translate those techniques into something that English poetry is familiar with, or do you just do it as it is and people go, hey, this is not poetry as we know it. You know, it's, it's that kind of, again, generalized tension. Um, a lot of Korean poetry starts with the evocation of an experience and then says, boom, at the end. Um, but then uh, also a lot of it uh, seems to be written for children. I mean, there's a very famous uh, poem from the 1920s, Sane, Sane, Kochi, Pine. In the hills, in the hills, flowers bloom. And Koreans will say, oh, isn't that beautiful? And uh, yeah, we don't. Because as um, I was reading your translation of Yimunyul's book, Yimunyul's Yimunyul's book, Poet, and, and there's a point when the poet who's, um, so this is a, um, it, it's, a real, it's a real Korean poet, and, but it's, it's a sort of fictionalized biography semi-fictionalized biography of, of this uh, 19th century poet who traveled around Korea. And he starts his career with a, there's a moment when he's been out on the mountains and he comes down off the mountain and uh, he meets somebody that's a drunkard in the inn, I think, isn't it? And he, um, he's challenged to, I think he's sort of trying to show off a bit and he says, um, oh, I've done this wonderful poem and he comes up with something which this is not, forgive me, this isn't it, but it was something like um, hill, hill, cloud, cloud. You, you would know what it actually is. Yeah. And, and this is amazing, I think. It's, it's yeah, but that, that is more complicated <laughs> still because that poem, of course, is ch classical Chinese. Oh. So, <coughs> uh, because until, until the 20th century, most normal Korean poetry was written in classical Chinese and it's exactly the problem facing the translator of classical Chinese, which has no grammar. Right. And our problem is not, because Korean has plenty of grammar. It has lots of grammar. It just grammar adds syllables on syllables on syllables for grammar. Um, uh, but the main, you see, uh, until recently, <coughs> poetry has often been yes, a little bit uh, simple. Yes, uh, there are an awful lot of South Korean, I don't know North Korean, but South Korean writers, poets, uh, whose poetry is quite simple because they are writing for simple readers. And um, simple readers like simple poetry. And um, uh, 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 this is part of the problem in, for poetry today in the world. So often it's so totally incomprehensible that nobody bothers to read it anymore. Uh, there's another, oh sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, once more. Uh, uh, but actually what's happening now, if the younger generation of Korean poets, the older poets say, I can't understand what he's writing. Because they've gone away from the simple experience of nature or life uh, and, or being. Uh, and they are doing things with images and words that, uh, that are really very, very challenging. I mean, they are more contemporary, they're more modern in a sense, but it's much more difficult. And, and, and to add, add to the simplicity, um, you know, it's, it's kind of easy for, I think, people who don't read it in that language, you know, you know, when you go, oh, that's so beautiful, and no one else gets it, you know. And, and because so much of it is not about the poem itself, it's about the context in which you read the poem, which, which adds to the poem, and I think maybe folk songs or folk poetry is a really good analogy because the folk poetry works in a context and it can be removed so much that it works in many contexts that it's almost kind of so stripped down and simple that it becomes universal. But well, you, yeah. that, that simplicity is not just simple, it's kind of so condensed, you know, almost like black spirituals or... It's like Matisse's um, single line drawings which look like he's just gone like that and, and actually endlessly, endlessly worked and overworked in order to achieve that effect. But in South Korea also poetry until at least until recently was part of the middle high school curriculum and people were taught poems in terms of this is a very beautiful poem. 
and because Koreans are very obedient and respectful of authority. If your teacher told you this is a beautiful poem, then it must be a beautiful poem. I'd like to move on a bit, actually, to your own writing. And um, but given that this is a literary translation center, just about the choices you've made about whether to write in English or Korean. Um, and I was going to start with Chris, actually. Did, did you grow up speaking and writing Korean? Um, at what point did you decide that your own creative writing should be in English, or was it not a choice? Well, I mean, my, we immigrated when I was uh, young because, uh, well, um, the government was after my father, <laughs> so we had to leave. And um, I ended up coming back to Korea after university, so I chose to write in English because my schooling was in English, and I think that's essential. I mean, I dream in both languages. My daily language now is actually Korean, but uh, the schooling, I think, is dictated the language um, that I choose to write in. Uh, by default also, I mean, uh, English is, it, it's, it's a market that reaches a larger audience, so there's, there's that as well, but it wasn't a consideration. Um, but I, it, the interesting thing about that question is, I now, I started teaching creative writing at Yonsei University um, in Korea at an international college uh, last fall. And uh, many of my students are bilingual. They come from, uh, they're Korean, but they've lived maybe in Singapore, or Thailand, or in America, or Britain, um, or they've lived in Korea their entire life, but they've gone to an international school most of the time. And so I have students who are writing, uh, they make very conscious choices about this, and many of them are choosing to write in English and Korean, or one of my students has actually debuted as a fiction writer in Korean already. His, uh, he's got a short story collection out, but he's chosen now to really focus on his English uh, writing because, again, it reaches a larger audience. So it's interesting that these people who've lived much of their lives or all of their lives in Korea, if they have that access to English, they may be working with both, or they're having to make that conscious choice today. Have you tra has Drifting House been translated into Korean? Uh, we've been holding back uh, because they're, uh, we've decided we want to sell as a two-book deal, so I'm trying to finish my novel. But uh, the, the Koreans that, who have read, I mean, certainly it's one of the things that you are interested in, in reactions. And yes, I'm actually going to a book club of Koreans as soon as I get back, and they're all reading my book. <laughs> Shelley, what about you? Was it ever an option for you to, to write in Korean? You, you um, sounded like you've been speaking it's English. A, or, yeah. Obviously, it's a free world, and I could have written in Korean, but I don't think... Um, you know, I've, I've heard Koreans tell me, oh, you know, you, you know, you hear it quite a lot, oh, your generation is so lucky, you, you can speak English and understand Korean, and, you know, you can choose. And for me, it was never a choice. I, I, do, I would never be able to do justice to the Korean language or to Korean literature or to live up to that, that world. I, I couldn't be one of it. I can kind of look in and translate out of it or live in it, but I couldn't, I couldn't create something out of it. I, I, don't, I don't feel like, you know, unless I kind of submerge myself in that world, I just, I've been an English speaker and it, 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 I, I had no choice. Yeah. I asked Brother Anthony whether he, had, having lived in Korea for 40 years, whether he had ever considered writing in Korean. No, you can't. I was nearly 40 when I arrived and started to learn you can't do it. Yeah. Um, I think we've got time for some questions, and I wondered whether um, anybody in the audience has some questions. Yes, here we go. There's a microphone. Uh, which will in Comparing uh, China, Japan, and Korea, one thing that struck me, because I lived in Korea for a few years, one thing that struck me very much was the big, big difference of Korea from the other two is the importance in the past that was given to scholars. You know, you, could, you can characterize Japan as a samurai-dominated culture and Korea as the scholar-dominated culture. And uh, I was just wondering, because that, that sort of identity thing came up and would there be any mileage in, in helping the rest of the world see Korea from that angle? Very interesting. Yes, well, I, I, yes, exactly. Um, scholars rather enjoy sitting in pavilions, drinking wine, uh, 
uh, being lulled by the music played by beautiful young ladies um, and doing a minimum of work. And uh, Koreans have a talent for in, uh, in <coughs> enjoying life and being togetherness, togetherness. But uh, also, I mean, more seriously, of course, the novel, the, the poet, is about that world, the world of the scholars and um, the, the Confucian Chinese classics. And still today, of course, you know, somebody who is professor or teacher, uh, this is uh, an up, you know, this is up something. Uh, yeah, so uh, certainly, I, I, and there is a delicacy. There's a delicacy also, uh, a sensitivity in relationships, which has something to do with that heritage, I think. Yeah. There's a question from the lady standing. Hi, uh, that's very enlightening to listen to uh, your talk. And uh, how do you choose which book to translate? Do, uh, do you, you know, wait for the uh, publishers to approach you or do you even work for individual authors? And how does that work? In I'll, I'll start, but I'm, I'm sure that all of us will have something to say about this one. I mean, as, as I said um, you know, before, I was, uh, you know, I'm really interested in a lot of contemporary literature and voices that excite me, um, whether it's in poetry or fiction. So things that came my way and were interesting to me personally, I translated. Um, at this point, uh, the novels I'm working for, it has much to do with the personal relationship that I have with the writer, but when he came to me with a second book and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm already overwhelmed by the first and my own novel, I took it on because again, I thought I had a lot to learn as a writer from this unreliable first person narrator and it was, a, and it was an intriguing book on a project. Um, I've also had writers send me books asking me if I will translate them um, and and you might love the book, but there's such a finite amount of time. And again, especially because I am a writer first and then a translator, uh, you want to translate the books that you love. I started a wonderful book by a, a writer who I can't say enough about. He's actually one of the writers here during the London Book Fair. His name is Lee Sung Woo. I think he's just an incredible, incredible fiction writer, um, you know, in any language. Um, and I had the opportunity to translate the novel that won one of Korea's most prestigious prizes, I started and I couldn't because again of time. And so that's really, you know, you want to translate the work that you love and uh, it's really unfortunate sometimes that it's such a labor of love and so many people here who do translate know how long it takes to finish a 350 page novel um, that's very dense. Um. Yeah, I don't really know. There's a there's a word in Korean called inyan, which has to do with destiny and fate or something. There are lots of people who, I mean, there, I, mostly I do poetry, but lots of poets whose work I will never translate. And why did I choose? Why did I start to translate uh, ko -un? For example, I mean, ko -un is the poet I translated most. There are eight books more coming. Um, but ko -un, when I started to translate Cohen in 1991, uh, I hadn't quite realized, I, I realized later that, in fact, there was a sort of word out from the Korean government that Cohen should not be translated and published abroad. So since nobody told me that, I translated <laughs> Cohen and published him abroad, and that was, in fact, the first translation of Cohen. And um, for me, anyway, that was a very good reason for doing it. But I did it because a friend of mine said, you must translate Cohen. And then I met Cohen, and one thing led to another. Um, now, of course, the, the whole process has become much bigger. We have here the uh, Literature Translation Institute of Korea, which is a government body with a huge budget and uh, very, very active, very good, very important work. Uh, and they have, for example, lists of works uh, that Korean critics reckon deserve to be translated. And if you apply for a translation grant of another work, uh, then some Korean critics uh, are asked to say whether they reckon it deserves to be. This is government interference, of course. 
uh, but it's part of the standard process. But uh, I, I don't know why I translate what I do. But um, yes, certainly, I, I'm happy with what I translate, and the pe and then you meet the poets. Shelley, what about um, fun funny points about government interference? Well, one of the reasons I started doing translation, one of the first things I did was the Chinese poetry, and I did that because he was my my, my husband's British, and this poet's Chinese, but they're they're like blood brothers almost, and it, it was a friendship, Inyan destiny that that started it more than anything and, and for me there was also it's kind of the opposite of government interference it's it, it's more like it's more like western interference if, if not if that's i don't know how to explain it. It, it there's certain things that people were picking and you know cherry picking from chinese literature and it, it wasn't just a case of it's not representative of what people in china think it was it was more like, oh, look, someone is protesting against the government, therefore it's good poetry because Western people like protest against the government, and then it would become the Chinese canon in the West, and it would not reflect the kind of position of, of what it was to Chinese writers and readers. And, and, and for me, it was, it was, that was kind of a real motivator for me to, you know, to, to take translation seriously. Is, is it, for me, it was as well as translating the work itself, I wanted to translate some of the context of, 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 of what the author was feeling in, in, in his world or her, her world, world and help bring that across, not just the work, but the author. Well, I had, I had fun because I, at the same time as Kuo and I was translating Sajong Zhu, who was the most official poet in Korea. But, um, so, uh, totally different kind of poetry and two, totally different kind of person doing it together. <laughs> Um, I'm afraid we're almost out of time, and the nature of uh, doing a lot of sessions of um, in translation, and, and luckily this is we've been able to speak in English language the whole time, which makes life a lot easier. But we've actually not heard very much uh, Korean literature in Korean, and what I wanted to finish off with was by asking Brother Anthony if he would read first his translation of one of Cohen's <coughs> poems, so that we know what it's about, and then. Perhaps finish off by I don't, reading it in I don't have the Korean of Korn. You don't have the Korean? Yeah. Well, then in that case, we'll just have the translation, but yeah. at least we'll hear that. Yeah. That would be great. I think that would. Yes, yeah. thank you. Uh, this is from uh, First Person Sorrowful that Blood Axe produced the year before last. Uh, <coughs> some advice. Poems, the path for better poems. Poems block the path for subsequent poems. Poems, poems, my blue poems. Escape somehow from the history of poetry, from fashions of poetry, from a hundred years of poetic authority. Be born trembling, wild, and alone. Thank you very much indeed.